The United States has committed to defending the Philippines, including in the South China Sea. The word used, ironclad. It's what President Joe Biden said to Philippines President Ferdinand Marcos Jr. during the first White House visit by a Philippines leader in 10 years. The commitment comes at a time that Manila is facing increased Chinese assertiveness in the South China Sea. Beijing unilaterally claims almost the entire expanse of water as its own, a claim shown here by this red line. Now, this includes islands which Manila claims sovereignty over. Sovereignty that's increasingly being challenged by Beijing. On the South China Sea, a tense standoff comes to a head. A Chinese Coast Guard ship steams directly in front of a Philippines patrol vessel, cutting off its journey toward the nearby Spratly Islands. The collision course set by the Chinese despite earlier communications. In accordance with international and Philippine national laws, we are proceeding according to our planned rules. Request to stay clear from our passage in accordance with collision regulations. Over. In the past of the friendly relationship between China and the Philippines, we hope you can cooperate with our deeds. Do not take inappropriate behaviors which will interfere with maritime security. The Philippine ship was on its way to territory claimed by Manila in the Spratly Islands. Claims contested by China, which claims full sovereignty over all islands and features in these waters. A fiercely disputed stance that's getting new pushback from Manila. Since taking office last June, Philippines President Ferdinand Marcos Jr. has insisted that China will not trample on Philippines' rights at sea. During a visit to Beijing in January, Marcos and his Chinese counterpart, Xi Jinping, agreed to a friendly handling of maritime spats. But just weeks later, the Philippines accused China of blinding a Coast Guard crew with a laser light. Manila's choice to go public with the footage, a new strategy to confront Chinese aggression on the world stage. Marcos has also moved to strengthen the Philippines' military alliance with the U.S. In April, the two countries held military drills, which included the first ever live fire exercise on territory in the South China Sea, a demonstration of joint firepower that's drawn Beijing's ire. Now in Washington, Marcos was met with a warm welcome from U.S. President Joe Biden and a pledge of military support. The United States also remains ironclad in our, remains ironclad in our commitment to the defense of the Philippines, including the South China Sea. Biden and Marcos said this commitment means honoring a decades-old mutual defense pact. Closer security ties between the two countries have been in play for months. Earlier this year, Manila granted the U.S. access to several additional Philippines bases, an arrangement that strengthens the Philippines' defense capabilities and grants the U.S. a stronger foothold to counter what it sees as the biggest potential threat in the South China Sea region, a possible invasion of Taiwan by China. Joining me now for more context on this is author, columnist and political scientist Richard Hedarian. Richard, an ironclad commitment from the U.S. to defend the Philippines, including in the South China Sea. Does this make the Philippines safer or increase chances of a real confrontation with Beijing? Well, as far as the statement ironclad is concerned, this is kind of a cliche, diplomatic cliche that the United States uses with not only treaty allies like the Philippines, but we hear also that term when the United States talks about its relationship with Gulf countries, Persian Gulf countries in the Middle East, for instance. So I think that word doesn't carry as much water, except when the Biden administration clarifies the parameters of its mutual defense treaty with the Philippines. And this is something that has been quite vague all the way from the Nixon administration until the Obama administration. But from the late Trump years to the Biden years, now the Americans are absolutely clear. If Filipino aircrafts, vessels or soldiers come under attack in the South China Sea, not vaguely in the Pacific, but in the South China Sea, that will be covered by the mutual defense treaty by the United States. And that's particularly important in light of what has been happening over the past few days. The Philippine Coast Guard 
uh, accusing China of harassing them. And the harassment by the Chinese Coast Guard actually was caught by a number of journalists who were accompanying the Philippine Coast Guard. And a few months ago, you had a Chinese warship reportedly pointing a uh, military-grade laser at the Filipino uh, patrol vessel, also in the contested areas of the South China Sea. So this, these tensions give a certain poignancy uh, to these ironclad statements by the Biden administration. But what comprises an attack on Philippine sailors? I mean, what you're talking about is something that is there in our report as well. Let's look at the confrontation between the Chinese Coast Guard and the Philippines Coast Guard. If it were to pass that the Chinese Coast Guard rams a Philippines Coast Guard vessel accidentally or otherwise, would that constitute an attack and hence the mutual defense treaty would come into play? Yeah, so since 2019, if, if, because there was another incident back then whereby a suspected Chinese militia force actually rammed into a Filipino fishing uh, vessel and almost sank dozens of Filipino fisher folks, uh, that incident actually made the Allies think about the precise guidelines uh, that oversee their alliance. So one of the issues that is still being discussed, because we still have to upgrade our mutual defense treaty, come up with new guidelines, is the so-called gray zone attacks. So gray zone attacks concern cases whereby you're not looking at, you know, Chinese vessels shooting down, let's say, Filipino aircrafts or using guns or firearms, but actually using something just short of that, but coercive still in nature. This is something that the Pentagon and their Filipino counterparts have been seriously discussing, but that will be a very, very, uh, let's say, formal process because we really have mm -hmm. to pin down what are going to be the guidelines that will govern the application of the Mutual Defense Treaty. Now, there is the dispute with China in the South China Sea, and then there are U.S.-China tensions over Taiwan. And I almost get the impression that the former is really what is important to Manila, but it might not have much of a choice when it comes to involvement with the latter, that is, over Taiwan. Do you agree? My sense is the challenge right now is to get a Goldilocks level of American military presence in the Philippines. If you look at the statements by Marcos Jr., he constantly talks about these spaces will not be used for offensive purposes. There will not be a staging ground. He constantly talked about ahead of his meeting with Biden this week that he wants to talk about trade and investment. So Marcos Jr. is very conscious about not provoking China. So a Goldilocks presence means that there's enough Americans on, in Philippine sites under the Enhanced Defense Cooperation Agreement to make China think twice about whether invading Taiwan or bullying the Philippines more aggressively in the South China Sea. But you want to make sure there are not too many Americans or, more importantly, too aggressive American weapon systems to provoke, provoke China. And as far as I know, we're still negotiating how many American troops can enter the Philippine bases under the ETCA and what kind of weapon systems they can put. Is it some artillery system or Patriot missile systems? Those things matter. They're operational and logistical, but have huge strategic implications. And I think Marcos Jr. is still not fully committed. You know, you, you talked about staging post for military action and uh, President Marcos saying that he doesn't want the Philippines to be used as a staging post. But does he really get that choice when he is a treaty ally of the United States? Yeah, and this is where the argument comes in, whereby the administration officials would say, this is about deterrence after all. You better be prepared and deter rather than just pretend that you're neutral when China is not going to treat you neutral. If, if things come down to an invasion, then the Philippines will be treated as a U.S. ally and accordingly China will respond or actually preemptively uh, deal with the Philippines. So better just, you know, damn if you do, damn if you don't, right? So better just get prepared for it. But the better argument actually there is that, you know, if the Philippines tweaks and twists the level of exercises, et cetera, it has with, with the U.S., then maybe uh, it will be effective and de uh, deter China. But, but one thing I really want to talk about here is that everyone talks about invasion of Taiwan. What the Philippines has to prepare for is also gray zone uh, uh, threats that China could pose to the Philippines. You know, we could talk about cyber attacks, we could talk about economic sanctions, 
there are many things that China can do to the Philippines to retaliate against this widening uh, security cooperation with the United States. And I think those are the things that Marcos has to be prepared for, because I personally doubt there'll be an all-out war in the in the short term, and I, my sense is that's also the calculus of Marcos. But he has to prepare the Philippines for gray zone retaliations by China. And on that, he has to get maximum assurance and training and backup from allies like the United States. How prepared is Manila for any of these gray zone tactics should Beijing choose to respond to these latest meetings between President Biden and President Marcos? Yeah, the term we use actually is sharp power. So we're not only looking at harassment of our vessels in the South China Sea. We're not only looking at cyber attacks against the Philippine critical infrastructure. We're also looking at, for instance, China, you know, using its influence over regional governors or local government officials, no, uh, to push its agenda against what Manila wants for the whole country. That's something that the Philippines has to really be prepared for. Vulnerability is extremely high. 40% of the Philippines national grid is controlled by a Chinese company. Chinese engineers are running a lot of critical infrastructure in the Philippines. China Telecom via a Filipino partner is also in the Philippines, has even towers inside military facilities in the Philippines. Multiple right. times the Philippine main airport had a shutdown this year. So the vulnerability is tremendous. That's why let's hope Marcos is really prepared for this. Otherwise, he's playing with fire. You know, President Marcos Jr. was in Beijing at the start of the year. He was meeting President uh, Xi. After this latest meeting with President Biden, where are Philippines-China ties? Right. So just the other week, uh, the Chinese foreign minister visited the Philippines to do that kind of a troubleshooting. But it seemed that meeting didn't really go that far. After the end of the meeting, all the two sides could agree to was just more communication channels, which is what we had an abundance or abundance of under former President Duterte was extremely close to China. So it looks like the bilateral relationship is in total crisis right now. But still, China has an option. Marcos will try to reach out to China. I don't know what he's going to offer them. But I think more important than the question is what is China going to offer the Philippines? Because they offered, they really gave the Philippines nothing in those six years that they were extremely charming with President Duterte. So I think Marcos wants to go back to the Chinese again sooner than later, right. but he wants to go there with a the bargaining chip. So the, the U.S. alliance could be a bargaining chip also in his dealings with China. Always a pleasure talking to you, Richard. Thanks so much for joining us today, Richard Hedarian.